Steph Davis here from FlipThisWholesaler.net. I am here on a very rainy and gloomy Tuesday afternoon in St. Petersburg uh, to bring you a brand new reader mail video. Uh, I know it's been a while, but I've got a brand new question from one of my subscribers as well as an answer for you guys. Um, this week, my question comes from Mark in Memphis, Tennessee, and Mark's question reads, Hi, Steph. I just started learning about wholesaling in the beginning of this year. And I'm still a little, actually a lot, skeptical that this can be done with little or no money. It seems like all of the major players in this business are spending thousands every month to get deals. I don't have that kind of money and I don't feel like wasting my time if this isn't possible. Also, there are so many wholesalers in my city of Memphis that I think it's close to impossible to get a deal. Should I move to another market or stay here? Any advice would be appreciated. Thank you, Mark. All right, so we've got a two-part question here. Part number one is, can you do this business with little to no money? Part number two uh, is, it should I go to another market because there's too much competition in Memphis or you could apply this to any market where there's a lot of competition? So we'll start with the first part of this question. Uh, yes, you can absolutely do this business wholesaling with little to no cash. However, it is a heck of a lot easier if you've got a big chunk of money or you know consistent money coming in to spend on marketing. Direct mail costs money, um, ads cost money, internet leads cost money. Um, so obviously it is a lot easier if you've got cash. However, you can absolutely close deals, um, close wholesale, wholesale deals with little to no cash. You're going to have to hustle a little bit more, however, uh, if that's the case, if you don't have any cash for marketing, and you're most likely going to have to put in a little bit more time. All right, I know uh, I've seen people over the years, including myself, who have gotten started in this business with nothing except for a drive and a desire to succeed. Um, for those of you who do not know my story, when I got started back in 2000. Six. Well, I quit my job as a bartender in 2006. I had no income coming in. I had no savings. I had almost, I mean, very close to nothing to put towards marketing. Um, but I was out there and I busted my butt and I did what I had to do. I was out putting flyers out at gas stations, banks, ATMs. Uh, I went to RIA meetings, did a ton of networking. Um, I did a lot of cold calling. Whatever I had to do, I was willing to do it. So um, I can tell you from firsthand experience that, yes, it can be done with little to no cash. However, it's a lot easier. I'm not going to lie. Um, you're going to have to hustle and you're going to have to put some time into it. So uh, with that being said, I want to tell you a little bit about a student of mine. Um, he uh, signed up with me last year. Um, and, and by the way, I have his permission to tell, kind of tell you guys his story. Um, but he was in the same position. His name is Jacob. He was in the same position as you are, Mark. Um, you know, didn't have a whole lot of cash to get started, was kind of wondering whether or not this could be done. He worked all week. His only days off were Saturday and Sunday. So what we did was we sat down, came up with a, uh, a marketing strategy for him, something that wasn't going to cost a lot at all. Um, so what we came up with were three different types of marketing. Number one was driving for dollars. I'm sure you guys have all heard of it. Now, of course, this is going to cost you a little bit of money and gas, but he was able to um, swing that. So what he would do for a couple of hours on both Saturday and Sunday, he had two farm areas picked out that were very close to where he lived. He would go drive around those areas with a notebook um, and look for abandoned homes, homes that looked like they were in some sort of distressed situation. He would write down the address and then when he would get home, he'd do a little bit, bit of research on each one of those addresses to kind of find out what was going on. Now he was in an area where he could look up the address um, and see who the owner was. So if he you know, saw that it was a bank owned property, um, you know, he would scratch that off of his list. He could also look up and see or get a decent idea of what was owed on the property. So if he looked up the property address and it looked like the, the house was mortgaged to the hills, he would also cross that off. So after he uh, went out, did his driving for dollars, went and did his research on each one of those properties, whatever list he had left. And we're not talking about a huge list here. This is a very targeted, usually a small list of maybe, you know, sometimes 10, 15, 20 at the most each time he went out. Um, he would send them a letter 
that basically said, um, you know, hi, my name is Jacob. I'm looking to buy, I'm an investor looking to buy properties in your neighborhood. I noticed that you have a property on whatever the address is. Uh, if you're interested in selling it, give me a call. And then he would put his contact information. So uh, that was one thing that he would do on both Saturday and Sunday. Um, the other thing that he would do is sit down and cold call. He would go on Craigslist. He would get the newspaper. He would go on Zillow uh, for sale by owners. Um, any listing that was listed in his, any house for sale that was listed in his farm area that appeared to be listed at somewhat of a discount. Um, those were the ones that he was calling. Typically, if a house is listed at full market value, you're not going to be dealing with a motivated seller. So um, he had a pretty good grasp of what the values were in uh, both of his farm areas. So he would look for um, properties for sale, you know, with, with prices, asking prices that were kind of below uh, market value because that kind of gives a little bit of indication that there's some sort of motivation there. So he would do that um, every Saturday and Sunday. And keep in mind, too, that Saturday and Sunday were his only days off. He worked all week. He worked long hours, and he was willing to put in the time um, basically all day Saturday, all day Sunday doing this. The last thing that... Um, that he did, which is kind of a neat trick, um, is to what he would do is he had gotten on a lot of wholesalers buyers lists. Um, so when they got a deal under contract, they would email him a property. Uh, he had been on these lists for about a year. So what he would do is go back uh, 45 days and look at those lists of properties that were for sale. Uh, he was in an area where when a property sells, it takes about uh, 30 days to show up in public records. So if he went and did a search for an address, um, you know, he could see within 30 days of the sale if it had been sold or, you know, he could see if it had been sold or not. So he would go uh, 40, 45 days back, look at the emails that other wholesalers had sent him of deals that they were selling um, 45 days back. He would go look up the address and see if it had sold. If it hadn't sold, um, he would try and contact the um, get the uh, owner's contact information okay and the uh, logic behind this is if a wholesaler gets a property under contract unfortunately a lot of times if they can't find a buyer for it they back out of the deal and then the seller is stuck you know still trying to sell their house so um, he would then any of those houses that he you know he would run the address do a search for the address if it showed up in the uh, records that it hadn't been sold he would try and contact the owners okay and he would do that by just going into Google and doing a search for the property address a lot of times when people have properties for sale they'll put them on um, Craigslist or Zillow or uh, there's all different kinds of online um, classifieds and a lot of times that um, listing will pop up along with the seller's um, phone number, okay, or the owner's phone number. So uh, if he couldn't contact them that way, and if he got a hold of them that way, he would just say, hi, you know, I, I looked at your house a couple months back. I'm just curious if it's still for sale, okay? If he couldn't find the owner's phone number, he would just send them a letter, the same letter, letter that he would send to those driving for dollars leads. It basically just said he was an investor looking to buy properties in that neighborhood. Uh, are you interested in selling? Okay, so these were the three things that he put into action. Uh, again, none of them cost a whole lot of money. You're going to have a little bit of postage there, but you know, with the, those leads that he's getting from old wholesaler deals, those aren't going to be huge lists either. Um, you know, after you do your research and after you, um, you know, there's not, it's just not a huge list. You might have like five or ten each time you um, you go back and and see those properties that were for sale. So. Uh, he committed to doing this. Uh, we said, you know, do this for 90 days. Uh, we'll see, you know, how things are going and then we'll adjust from there. So two months go by, uh, 60 days, and he, nothing is happening. Um, he started to get a little frustrated and I just encouraged him, you know, you just got to stick with this. It takes some time, time to gain traction. And that's one thing to keep in mind for all of you who are just getting started and you're watching this. When you put a marketing plan in place, it does take some time to get going. Um, but what happens is once you start sending out letters and once you start talking to leads, you know, you send out letters one month and then, you know, maybe the sellers say, I'm not interested. And then the next month, uh, their motivation might change or maybe the month after that. And when you keep that marketing going, it, it starts to build momentum. So um, anyway, after 60 days, he started to get kind of frustrated. And I said, just hang in there. Um, about uh, maybe two weeks after that, 
one of his uh, driving for dollars leads. This was a, uh, an absentee owner. The house was sitting there vacant. Uh, the person had inherited the property five or six years ago, and they decided that they were just willing to dump it. So he was able to get that property under contract. Um, he found a, he got it at a great, great price, found a buyer easily for that uh, $6,000 assignment fee. And a couple weeks after that, one of those wholesaler leads, uh, he was able to find the owner's contact information, call them up. You know, they said, yes, we are still trying to sell this property. We're at our wits end. He was able to get that one under contract as well. Now, one thing I want to point out um, with those wholesaler leads, I am not at all uh, advocating or um, in any way encouraging you or saying that you should be trying to go after other wholesalers' deals and cut them out of the deal. That's not what I'm saying at all. And as a matter of fact, on this particular deal that he got, what he did was he called up before he went out uh, and met with the seller and before he put it under contract, he called the wholesaler who originally had it under contract. Okay, he's got this person's phone number because the wholesaler sent him this lead, um, you know, with, with all of the information in his phone number. So he called this wholesaler up and said, you know, hey, you had this, this property for sale back in whatever month it was, um, you know, do you still have that available? And the wholesaler just flat out told him, no, I couldn't find a buyer and I had to back out. Okay, so um, I, I just want to make sure to stress that I am not at all um, trying to tell you guys or advocate going and trying to, to cut other wholesalers out of the deal. You absolutely don't want to be doing that. But um, anyway, he was able to get uh, this property under contract as well uh, and made a $4,000, uh, $3,500 assignment fee on this one. Okay, so uh, all of this, I've been kind of long-winded here, but all of this to say that, um, oh, and by the way, he put uh, $20 earnest money deposits down on each one of these and the uh, wrote the check out, had the check held in escrow at his title company. All right, so he's got $20 into each deal. Um, so again, all of this to say that yes, this absolutely can be done, even if you are on a very uh, tight budget or if you've got no extra cash. Now, he worked his butt off to get these deals. He was working every single Saturday and every, every single Sunday pretty much all day, uh, and he did it for two and a half months before he got that first deal. Um, most people would have given up before, you know, they would have given up at maybe a month or two months. So just keep in mind, very, very important when you're just getting started, it does take some time to gain traction. Um, you know, and, and once you get that, you know, he got the first deal, he got the second deal, and then all of a sudden you've got leads that you talked to a couple months ago and they're calling you, uh, seller's motivation changes over time, but you've got to keep that marketing in place and you've got to stick with it. So, um, as far as the second part of your question about competition, there's competition everywhere. Um, I think you said you were in Memphis. I have a good friend who just got into, he was wholesaling for a long time and he stopped for, I don't know, six, seven, eight years and just recently has gotten back into it and he is closing deals consistently. And, um, you know, where I'm at in the St. Pete, Tampa area, there are a ton of wholesalers and investors. It doesn't matter. Um, if you are marketing consistently, if you are getting out there, um, you know, every single day, keeping your marketing out there, making offers, talking to sellers, you're going to do deals. So just don't worry about the competition. I think it is, uh, would be absolutely silly for you to go into another market. There's competition everywhere. Okay. So, um, that is it for today. I feel like I've talked your guys' ears off, but, um, for those of you who are watching this, who are maybe thinking, well, you know, I don't even know where to begin if I'm cold calling these sellers or sending out letters. I don't know what to say. Um, if you have absolutely no clue and you're feeling totally lost, I do highly recommend picking up my uh, Quick Flip Ninja training. It is a step-by-step -step guide for beginners, who, you know, people who are just getting started wholesaling. It teaches you step-by-step. -step. It's how to choose a farm area, how to analyze your farm area, how to market for deals, how to talk to sellers, how to find buyers, how to put the, the deal together, all of that. It's $97 and it's worth every penny. I think it's like five hours of uh, video training uh, where I just walk you through how the whole process works. So uh, pick that up if you don't have any clue and you're feeling totally lost. Um, you know, if you've already gone through some, some wholesaling courses and you have a general idea and you, you understand how the process works, get out there and start marketing. Okay, uh, that's all I have for today. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.